This is the sermon for the Sunday of the Baptism of our Lord. Our reading this morning is taken from the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Our text actually begins with the thirteenth verse. However, I will be reading from the first verse in order to put our reading into its proper context. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Today, at least for some of the Christian world, is the festival of the baptism of our Lord. Our brief gospel lesson from Matthew, of course, recounts that event. The baptismal narrative may also, by the way, be found in Mark and Luke. This is traditionally a day when many preachers will take the opportunity to expound on the nature of the Trinity. After all, the text describes Jesus, the Son, as being visited by the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove and hearing the voice of the Father proclaiming his approval. Three distinct persons of the Trinity present in the same instant in time and space. But I'm going to leave any serious discussion of Trinity for a later time. It's a topic which I've preached on and taught about before, and we'll do so again, God willing, on Trinity Sunday in a few months. Before leaving the topic entirely, let me just say this much. Many do not like the concept, suggesting that it is unbiblical or borders on polytheism. To be certain, it is one of the most difficult concepts to explain to someone who comes from a tradition outside of Christianity, and in fact, many Christians reject the concept. I would just like to suggest this much. The Trinity may give us the most perfect example of community we can find, a community of absolute agreement and singleness of purpose, a community of equals who are each distinct and yet intrinsically part of each other. The word interdividual 
coined by theologian René Girard, comes to mind. Not individual, as in disconnected, separate, and seeking one's own benefits, but also not lacking in distinction. Jesus, for example, says that he and the Father are one, and that he and his disciples will be one. They in him, he in them. Yet Jesus is not the Father any more than Jesus is Matthew or Peter. So it is possible that in the Trinity we have an example, a picture, if you will, of the perfect peace our human community shall attain as we mature into the likeness of Christ. I'll speak more on this issue of Trinity as we move forward, and again, especially in my address for Trinity Sunday. But today I want to look more directly at the event itself, Jesus' baptism, and hopefully shed some light on what this event means for us. Over the years, I've heard any number of people ask, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Wasn't he the sinless Son of God? Now, the first thing we might want to consider is that the baptism Jesus underwent was not like the baptism that many Christians receive. He was not brought by his parents as an infant to be baptized. Of course, that would be a rather preposterous anachronism. Similarly, he did not make a profession of faith as such before going under the water. The baptism that John was administering on the banks of the Jordan was something very different than we might think of today. And not at all as uncommon as we might imagine. Baptism comes from baptizo, which means to wash, specifically by immersion. The implication is of repeated dunking, as one might cleanse dishes or eating utensils. Jewish tradition was full of ceremonial washings for household items and apparel, and even for people under certain circumstances. Like many cultures, Hebrew culture is rich in symbolism, and the meaning of the action appears to be clear. The baptism which John administered, the bautisma, the purification rite in which the whole person was immersed, signifies, or at least appears to signify, the spiritual cleansing brought about by repentance. But that begs the first question, if, as we read in Matthew, John's baptism was for repentance, then why did Jesus need to be baptized at all? Clearly, John himself is surprised by Jesus' appearance, queuing up along with the other sinners. In verse 14, John is recorded as saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Now, Jesus gives him an answer in verse 15. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. We might translate this text in this way. We need to do it. God's work, putting things right after all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. Those words are from Peterson's The Message translation. So the authors of Matthew cast John as reluctant, and Jesus as aware that the actions they take are spiritually necessary. But that still doesn't answer the question, why? And that may beg the question that I am forever asking, and I hope you are asking as well. What does any of this have to do with us? You see, it's fine to memorize a text and develop doctrines and finely crafted theologies. But if we get away from, 
or never confront the crucial and personal issue of how does this affect me and the ones I care for? How does this impact the world in which we live? We are simply perpetuating a legacy, however rich, of nonetheless empty tradition. I believe the key to our understanding is found, as it often is, in a clear, fresh, and in as much as possible, unprejudiced reading of the text in its context. Matthew tells us that John the Baptist is administering this baptisma for repentance. Repent, says John, for the kingdom of God is near. The word we translate, perhaps somewhat inadequately as repent, is metanoia. Now, we may think of repentance as being sorry, as a kind of emotional regret over actions done or left undone. But metanoia, as described by 19th century scholar Thomas Whitaker, is change of mind, a change in the trend and action of the whole inner nature, intellectual, affectional, and moral. Metanoia is a complete change of being, beyond feeling sorry, beyond, even as is often taught, a change in one's immediate actions. Although the first may be present, and the second most certainly will be, metanoia is a transmutation of the entire person, a transformation of will and intent, and in fact, purpose. So if Jesus comes to John and says, look, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness, then it very well may be that this is the place where Jesus focuses his understanding of who God is, where the human Jesus leaves behind any vestiges of belief in the violent God where Jesus makes clear his intent to be counted among the lowly and to be numbered with the sinners. It may be that the human Jesus needed to arrive at this understanding, shedding whatever old ancestral understanding he was born into. Perhaps. But what is clear is that Jesus is modeling for us a complete change of heart in terms of who God is and what God is like, what the Messiah, the Messiah, will be. Not a vanquishing warrior or an all-powerful emperor, but the fully human one, the one who leads the human family in the ways of peace, the ultimate change of mind and heart and being. Imagine Jesus the penitent leading humankind down the path to true repentance. And it is then that the Father gives his approval. Yes, this is my Son. I am pleased with him. I take delight in him. He is the one who gets it. He is the one who understands. It then follows that it may not be too much to suggest. We may not be overstating the case when I say that it may be the nature of the church to be a community of repentance, a community where our hearts and our minds, the way in which we think and feel about God and others and ourselves, must be transformed, where we ourselves are transformed, not just cleansed by the waters of baptism, the old self, just without the dirt, but irrevocably altered by baptism, not so much a cleansing, but a drowning, where the old self, the self that is prone to create gods in the image of its own violence, is drowned out of existence to be replaced by a soul that is growing, dare I say, evolving 
into the likeness of Christ, where we are being made in the image of the non-violent, non-retributive God. Now that may not sit well with us. We church people tend not to like the thought that we need to be changed. Changed so utterly, in fact, that we are not who we used to be. We like to think that we basically have it going on, and that all we need is a little spiritual shot in the arm. Metanoia, repentance, when defined as this fundamental, deeply endemic transformation, may not appeal to us. Perhaps that is why John the Baptist railed against the Pharisees when they too came to be baptized. You vipers, he called them in verse 7, before warning them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Perhaps he sensed their desire to change was less than sincere. But what of us? Did I mention that I am forever asking about what has this to do with us? We too are called to that place of change, the change that Jesus leads us to, metanoia. And if we don't, or if we won't, the opposite of metanoia. Another Greek word, this one has found its way into English, paranoia, literally to be beside one's mind, madness, if you will, but meaning essentially a state of mind characterized by perpetual anxiety and fear. When we confront God, even in fact when we confront the idea of God, it will either be with metanoia or paranoia. We may follow in the ways of Jesus, transforming our understanding of God until we see our Abba as the one in whom there is no darkness, until we know that in him there is no cause for fear, for he does no violence. In the words of Isaiah 42, he will not a bruised reed break, nor a dimly burning wick snuff out. Or we can create a God after our own paranoid delusions, angry, jealous, capricious and two-faced, randomly loving and frequently smiting those whom he loves. It is the God of paranoia, that God of vengeance, Regrettably, the God of Mars Hill and Hillsborough and too many others, and yes, sometimes the God of me and the God of you, that infects the spiritual imagination of much of Christendom and renders us as violent in thought and word and demeanor and sometimes deed as any fundamentalist of the other religions. As we move together through this season of Epiphany, and through our lives of faith, I pray we will heed the call to metanoia and be transformed so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. Mm -hmm.